Hi, April. Hello. Hi, everyone. Hi, Arno. Today, we are going to talk about the wines of Jerez, and Frank is here. Hi, Frank. How are you? Very good. And you? I'm good. I'm good. It's unbelievable. We got connected without any issues. Oh, yeah. you're upside down. So. Yeah, okay. Wait. I'll do it. It's okay. Yeah. Okay, great. Hi, Ricardo Zamora. Uh, yeah, we got connected without any issues, and the sound is good. Everything works well. It's amazing. It's amazing, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so today we have a quite broad topic. Yes. We're going to talk about Jerez. Jerez. Yes. <laughs> the yes. Point of Why, change. actually? Why? Why? Because, you know, I thought, I mean, you are very familiar with the area. Mm -hmm. You go there very often. Mm -hmm. And I said, we can take advantage of it. And then you can make us to travel there, uh, like mm -hmm. virtually. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, of course. Very good. Yeah? Very good. Okay, great. Yeah. Good evening, everybody. Welcome, everybody. It's not exactly... Five o'clock yet, is it? Or yeah. seven o'clock yet? No, mm -hmm. it's not seven so o'clock yet. So. Just wait a few seconds, but yeah. as you see, everybody, this time there are no technical issues and it all goes well from the start, which is amazing. Yes. Which is yeah. amazing, yeah, unbelievable. Yeah. Let's not jinx it. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> but it's very strange with Facebook, like every time something different happens and True. then it's very rare that everything goes well and today mm -hmm. it's one of those days yes it's amazing it's amazing so how's life in barcelona at the moment what's happening what's new uh now we are in the phase one barcelona is yeah. in the phase one meaning that uh, the, the restaurants the bars like but the only terraces open air areas are open yeah. Um, so still there are like time periods that we can go out, certain time periods that we can go out for sports or just walking. But as we are in a capitalist uh, world, mm -hmm. if you want to consume something or if you want to spend money, you can go out 24 hours a day. Sure. I mean, not 24 hours, but you don't have no, like a certain things, yeah. But now it's like it's uh, people are a little bit more like happy, I mm. think now because mm. we can go out and at least to see some friends. Uh, but obviously social distancing and the masks and so on. Mm. Yeah. yeah. How, how is there everything? How is it going there? Well, in the Netherlands, um, uh, restaurants were opened again, or let's say the entree opened again uh, last Tuesday, uh, Monday. So first of. Uh, June, and obvious, and the weather was very nice. And um, as, when you're inside, there are more restrictions than outside. So obviously, with the nice weather, um, mm -hmm. all the restaurants and bars uh, enlarged their terraces as much as possible. And there was a huge rush, of course, on that on that beautiful Monday, which is a, a bank holiday here, um, to, to to have a drink or a meal on um, uh, outside. Mm -hmm. um, what I what I noticed because we, we were one of them, of course, and my, my actually I've got two brothers who both have a restaurant, so um, yeah. I'm, I'm I am in that I'm, my family is in that business, and um, what I, what I noticed is that everybody everybody was obviously very happy because it's another step back to normality, and people haven't been able to go out uh, in this way for three months or almost three months, so people were really happy about that. Um, what, what you see is that that people are much less uh, cautious now. Yeah. People have been very disciplined until now. Um, they're losing all discipline. And I'm, it's, I'm not worried about myself. It's more that I'm worried about society and where, where it will go uh, if, unfortunately, uh, who knows, um, a, a new uh, outburst of corona um, would, would, would come. But I noticed that uh, people were uh, shaking hands, slapping each other on the back, not keeping in one and a half meter distance. And I don't think anyone did it deliberately. It was just that sort of sense of, of freedom and happiness. And, and then very easily people forget, you know. Mm -hmm. So I, I found that a bit worrying. But on the other end, it was great. And, um, and I, I don't think that... Um, 
that this particular situation is going to be the cause of a new epidemic. But um, mm -hmm. but yeah. yeah, people should be a bit careful, I suppose. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's same here. Yeah. You're totally right. Um, so let's give a social message that just. Mm. Don't relax 100% and no, keep no. cautious. Just keep cautious. Yes, exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So let's talk about Jerez. No? Exactly. A beautiful Jerez. Yeah. So we have like, I mean, the topic is the all shades of Jerez because there's so many things to talk about Jerez. And obviously we don't have enough time to cover everything. But what do you think? Maybe we can talk a little bit about like the, 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 the background, the history today and where Jerez is going. I mean, obviously Jerez is, the wines of Jerez is like there's so much range in the style, sweetness, yeah. color, so on yeah. and so forth. But also like the, the whole the industry also very fragmented and uh, the history is also i mean it has also obviously like the blooming mm. times and also mm. uh, dark times uh, right yes these are the dark times but maybe to understand the dark times we need to consider um, the good times or 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 you would actually ask yourself whether these were really the good times but anyway um um of course, Jerez uh, has a has a very long history, and and wines from Jerez have been uh, exported uh, for for five hundred years now. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, the two main export markets in the past were the Netherlands and uh, and England, mm -hmm. and they still are. And they still are. They still, so yeah. there's a, I mean, I I don't think anyone in the Netherlands would realize that, but um, because you will still find sherry um, in the assort in the assortment of every wine shop and every supermarket chain. Actually, just I want to stop you just here because it's a really important point. Because in many other wines in the world, if you think that within the time export mm -hmm. markets or the main markets they keep changing, but yeah. in the case of Jerez, it hasn't changed. Why do you mm. think that it is the reason? Mm. It's a good question, but 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 I think uh, I think in any case, um, the taste of sherry is not an easy taste. Huh? Okay. It's it's what you would call an acquired taste. It's something that you need to learn to appreciate. Mm -hmm. And so maybe it has been in the genes of the Brits or the English and the, the Dutch people. Well, I think it's actually more UK okay. and the Dutch people. Uh, the habit of, of drinking sherry and being a bit familiar with the taste. Although having said that, of course, in the current situation, um, the amount of consumers who still order and drink sherry in these countries has also slipped a lot. Still, still, there are relatively good markets for, for Jerez compared to other markets. So, mm -hmm. uh, But I don't know. It's, it's, it's yeah, why, why, are, why are things like that? But what I do notice, um, and, and um, we'll talk about that later on again, I suppose, but uh, the taste of sherry is not what everybody appreciates. If I look at my own children, they're really keen wine drinkers. They can appreciate virtually everything, but not sherry. Mm -hmm. Not sherry. We've been there with them a number of times over the years. And the taste of, a, I mean, sure, they can drink a glass of fino or whatever, but they wouldn't order it by themselves. They, they do not really appreciate it. Actually, I remember well that uh, the last time we were there a few years ago, they were uh, drinking uh, Castillo San Diego every day, which is a very cheap white Palomino-based mm -hmm. wine from Barbadillo, you know, mm -hmm. a very, yeah. which is very cheap and very simple wine, but they kind of preferred that to drinking uh, the finos that uh, I was drinking together with my wife. Mm -hmm. But anyway, yeah, yeah. But you know, let's let let let's go a little bit back. Um, Five hundred years of history, and then there was this huge boom after the Second World War. Huh? And again, you know, the boom was particularly strong in the Netherlands and in the UK. Exactly these two markets again. But I think um, what, what played a, a role at that moment was that um, these were two countries where wine was becoming, let's call it uh, democratically available. It, it, there was wine available now in supermarkets, there was cheap wine available. So all of a sudden wine was no longer for the elite, it was, it was uh, for mass consumption. And uh, as a first sort of step in building up a certain wine culture in these two countries, but actually in many other countries as well, you could say exactly the same from Scandinavia, for example, um, people began to, drinking sweet wine. And actually Jerez sort of almost reinvented itself at that stage by, by beginning to produce enormous amounts of medium dry sherry at very low prices. Um, 
I mean, behind that was uh, mostly Rumasa, the, the infamous uh, Rumasa. Well, we're not going to talk about all that now. We, we yeah. don't have enough time for that. Yeah, but that's, yeah. a, that's a different story. But in any case, it, 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 it suited the market to produce cheap, uh, sweet wine. And, and what happened was that, um, that, that there was a massive growth of, uh, of wine production and wine export and wine sales in the Jerez region. But unfortunately, of course, based mainly on lower qualities, high volume, lower price. Everybody was happy with that and made a lot of money and everybody was, was, was going in that, uh, in that direction. And, and certainly all the, the major brands. Uh, until, of course, uh, because trends come and trends go, until the trend ended, and especially ended, what ended was the trend to drink cheap sweetened wines or sweet yeah. wines. And um, I suppose by that time, first of all, the image of Jerez had been uh, damaged a lot. Um, they were not the only one. I mean, rosé got damaged uh, because of the sweet rosés. Uh, German wine got damaged. Um, there are plenty of examples, but Jerez really suffered from it, and um, and they never found the way out again, uh, because despite all the terribly interesting things happening and the wonderful wines that are being produced now, fortified or not fortified, it doesn't even matter. But uh, the region is still shrinking, so there is there is basically there's good news, but there's still predominantly bad news about Jerez. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, but, uh, but maybe it's because uh, because you were saying that uh, your daughters they really don't appreciate the taste. Can it no. be one of the reasons that Jerez still is like appealing to some certain audience, and some and they cannot really appeal to the modern or like younger generations? Could mm. be because of this commercial appeal. Well. Maybe, maybe. But uh, of course, uh, there are changes in the air. Um, and we have to talk about this. There's change in the air. But first of all, I think what, what Jerez is suffering from is uh, the same problem that the Deo Cava has and that uh, maybe the Deo Rioja, Deo Sierra Rioja to some extent has. And that is that um, by having been dominated for such a long time by very big producers, the whole system, the whole legislation, the whole Consejo Rador... Consejo Regulador, everything was kind of, um, I don't know, um, organized by, decided by, uh, aiming at the big producers. Mm -hmm. And um, this was not, this is not particularly helpful. Um, we talked about that in relationship to Corpinat. But in, in Jerez, it, there's a, a more or less similar situation where the, the small, adventurous, high quality producers feel or felt at least neglected by the Consejo Regulador, not heard by the Consejo, Regula, Consejo Regulador, and in some cases decided to go their own way. And in that, uh, the, and there's now plenty of wine in the area, which is actually really interesting, really good wine, but not under the De Ojeres. Mm -hmm. and, and it is exactly those wines, usually coming, usually not always, coming from young winemakers that find a new market. And mm -hmm. so I think um, Jerez in that respect uh, has to find, has to reinvent itself a little bit and open the door, open the door to more diversity. But, but to be fair, they started doing that. Mm -hmm. They started doing that. So mm -hmm. there is change in the air. Mm -hmm. Maybe yeah. also the, the now like the Rama and Rama style, it's also maybe part of this ch change, no? It's like more it is. natural, it is. unfiltered. It is, but although but, but, it is not a specifically or like general description of that style, even though within the producers themselves they cannot really agree, no, like no, how to describe it. No, that's true. That's true. I, for for me, mm, maybe we can we can we can we 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 can sort of divide the two between two directions to two things happening in the region. I think on the one hand. Uh, based on the on the old the well, old the traditional idea of Jerez and the floor and the fortification and all that and the Palomino, um, there have been developments that were aiming at uh, improving um, the quality and the image of Jerez. So um, when I think of a producer, I would think of Equipos Navasos, mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. And if I think of a, um, of a, a wine style, it could be indeed a rama. The problem of Enrama for me is that uh, Enrama can be delicious, but it is basically a better version of the traditional Fino and Mazzania. And um, Enrama is now also being pro produced in, in large quantities by the big producers. With all due respect, I think what Gonzalez Bias makes out of Enrama, that, that's... It, it's a good wine. I'm, I'm not going to say it's not a good wine. Eh? Tio Pepe and Rama is it's, it's good, but it's, it's, I doubt whether that is really helpful for the area. Mm -hmm. eh? uh, Barbadillo took a slightly different approach, making uh, uh, small, specific releases of uh, Rama, a small volume um, of Mazania. Uh, but but um, the best uh, Ramas come from, from the, the smaller, high quality producers. Uh, so, but in any case, so a rama is more like um, an improvement on the on the traditional style. What I find more important is is the young guys and girls, actually not just men, who are now active in the region. Um, Cota Cuarenta y Cinco, uh, Willy Perez, um, um, For Long, um, which are going completely new directions. You know, with unfortified wines. Luis Perez, who uh, began to make uh, Fino in the very old ways, meaning not fortifying, but drying the grapes in the vineyard so that you would get a natural, percent, natural alcohol of 15%. Um, Ramon, um, what's his name again? Damn. Ramon from, from Cota, uh, Cota 45, Cota 45, who is really fanatic about the vineyards, the different uh, soil types in the area, and he's not the only one, Carajuelas is, is doing that. And that, at the end, I think is much more interesting, much more going back really to the roots of what Jerez should be all about, the high quality of the vineyards. And, and in the past they knew, they knew exactly which were the best vineyards. Mm -hmm. Going back to that and, um, and, uh, and being less dogmatic about whether the wine should be fortified and even about the grape variety sometimes, you know. So, um, and I think those people with their approach and their style of wine uh, will have it easier to attract uh, young wine drinkers. Mm -hmm. I, I definitely believe in that. Yeah, and also, but, but on the other hand, I always have this sensation of like, unfortunately, the price is also affects the perception of the people. So mm. like Jerez wines being like great, <coughs> great wines and then the, 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 the super time consuming product, product uh, production and so on and so forth. But the prices are really so cheap if you compare it to the other mar uh, the wines True. from the global True. level. True. So this is or like maybe, I don't know, should be... Or why is it so cheap? Because it's generally Spanish wines are cheap, or is it yeah. because uh, because the market is already they're losing the market share and they are scared to raise the prices? But maybe should be something done about this. Mm. Not the... I think it's a combination of things because it is true that uh, I mean in the current market for Jerez to increase prices is bloody difficult, of course. Uh, but 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 it is possible because, uh, uh, for example. Uh, Cota 45, that's not cheap. Equipos mm -hmm. Navasos is not cheap. So it is possible to, to, to sell at higher prices. Tradicion is not cheap. Uh, uh, people mm -hmm. are prepared to pay, to pay more money. But all of these producers produce uh, low volume, low volume, high quality. Mm -hmm. And um, I, th I think the problem of the region is, of course, that the majority of the production is still by far uh, in the hands of the, the big producers. And the big producers are, are only good in, in uh, keeping production costs low and selling the wines at relatively low prices. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and unfortunately, uh, as, as, as it has been the case in the, the, is the case in the Okawa, to some extent in Rioja, the whole system, the whole area is based on the, on the idea, uh, keep grape prices low, keep wine prices low. Mm -hmm. And that is very unfortunate. Yeah. yeah. And maybe the other thing also, although we spoke about this last week, we were spoke, speaking about the, the rising alcohol levels. So mm -hmm. before, uh, Jerez wines were like super strong, fortified yeah. wines, 15 plus yeah. alcohol and more. But yeah. now 15% alcohol is not a fortified wine, it's a table yeah. wine, it's the normal yeah. norm. Yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, but still, when uh, consumers think about uh, Jerez, Fino, mm-hmm. Manzanilla, they say, oh, no, it's super strong. Well, still that's, because that's, of the perception. Yeah, maybe. yeah, that's true. But this is also it was also it still is actually the legislation. Huh? So what you see now is that some people like like Carajuelas, for example, or, or Ramon in Cota Forty Five, they produce uh, non fortified, um, um, regular white wines coming from some of the best vineyards. Um, with much lower alcohols, of course, obviously, alcohol around 13%, for example. And uh, that's why I say that I believe that, that in a way, this will be uh, this kind of wine and this, this approach will in many ways be uh, uh, more acceptable to, to young consumer, to the millennial market, so to say, than, than just trying to improve the old style. Okay. Because you, maybe you have to accept that for the old style, uh, the, the traditional approach of, of, of sherry with high alcohol, with fortification, um, uh, that, uh, there, of course, there will always be a market, but it will always be a small market. And, um, and, and I think what you don't want and what they're a bit afraid of in the area is that they end up at the end uh, um, as, a, as, a, as a rarity, almost like Jura, you know. The, somebody once said to me in the Consejo Regalador, we don't wanna, want to end up like Jura. And I do not want to insult any people who love Jura, but Jura is nothing. It's 1,200 hectares. It's below everybody's radar. There was a very short-lived trend after uh, the publication by, um, uh, who was it again? Wink Lorch, I think, the book. So was it Wink Lorch who wrote about Jura? I think it was. Yes, it was, it was Wink Lorch. So for a while it was very trendy and all the sommeliers were trying to get the good bottles from Jura. This is over. This is over, you know. It was a trend that lasted two, three years and that was it. It wasn't even a trend. It was a hiccup. Mm-hmm. And um, you, d- you don't want to be there as a wine region. You, re- you really don't want to be there. No. Mm-hmm. I, I went to the Jura few, some years ago with a group. You were not there, no? No, no you were not. I've never been to Jura. Um, and it was, it was lovely and it was terribly interesting. And we visited the top estates. But what struck me is that most of them were really poor. You could mm. see there was no money being earned. You know, mm-hmm. That's not the purpose of it. If you make very good wine, you should also have a decent living. Otherwise, the whole idea is not sustainable. You, there will be no future. So, yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah and uh, maybe you were saying like about the legislations. Uh, yes, by law, like to be called Jerez or fortified wines, it needs to be minimal 15% alcohol. Yeah. But if you talk about the uh, uh, Fino and Manzanilla, the wines which are biologically aged by Flor, yeah. Flor is also consumes the alcohol. So normally yeah. you can also see examples of Fino and Manzanilla which are even like 14% alcohol. But then to be able to have it by law, they do the second certification, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah what yeah, if yeah. they don't do that? What if they just leave it as it is? Yeah, then you cannot call it Deo Yeah, Yeah, that's the thing. But they have been working on changes. Eh? So Willy, Willy Perez, Luis Perez, Willy Perez, he got the right to go back to the old way of producing uh, fino uh, by drying the grapes and not by adding fortification. So the first step has already been made. Mm-hmm. Jerez no longer, but this is only since last year, no longer has to be a fortified wine. Mm-hmm. That's a good step. Um, but to be honest, I'm not sure what the new regulation says about the minimum alcohol, but I reckon it's, it's probably still 15. And I think they should let that go as well. Mm-hmm. I think they should focus on, on the origin of the region, the, the beautiful vineyards with uh, Albariza soil, and, and whether you make a, a wonderful floor-typed uh, Palomino-based white wine with uh, 12 and a half alcohol and very drinkable or you want to make us an 80 year old Amontillado, that shouldn't matter. It's both from, after my opinion, it comes from Jerez. It should both be called Deo Jerez. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, actually, uh, Jansen Robinson on one of her articles, he was, she was comparing uh, Jerez to Champagne, saying that Champagne yeah. and Jerez has very similarities, like terroir, German, the soils, chalk, and then you make uh, from the initial style, you make totally something different, the blending yeah. age and so on and so forth. But exactly. Champagne has all the, the fame, uh, influence of yeast, and yeah. Champagne has all the fame and the celebrity aspect, but the Jerez has, I mean, it's like, it's really very undervalued. 
Uh, it's absolutely true. I, I yeah. fully agree. And, uh, and this is a great shame. This is a great shame. But I'm, I'm, I'm not a pessimist. And I'm, I'm sure slowly uh, Jerez will find its way out. Um, but we're not probably not yet low enough. I'm sorry to say. Yeah. And then, and then on the other hand, I mean, it, of course, when the industry was so important, it was also wonderful. I mean, it was the whole area lift from from wine production, and the the older people in Jerez, the older winemakers, they will all tell you, you know, when I when I was a kid, um, every day in the year, this town was smelling of sherry. Actually, you could smell it everywhere because the whole city was packed with wineries where thousands and thousands, actually ten thousands of bottas were aging and there was the smell of floor all over the place. This has completely gone. Mm -hmm. Of the big ones, there are just a few left and most of them are outside the city now mm -hmm. for logistical reasons. And, and it's very sad to walk through Jerez nowadays and see all the empty spots where either there was a bodega or there still is a, a building that you can recognize as a former bodega, but it's empty or containing a, a supermarket or a parking lot or whatever it's mm -hmm. it's really very sad yeah i mean i i have never been to Jerez, unfortunately you should yeah i i should and you have been going there for many many years so like what is the industry like the segmentation is on the suppliers is it more like growers or amazonistas like like in the real <laughs> real life always like obviously it's like what you read on the books and the theories but yeah. is it the growers play play a very unimportant role unfortunately because there are just a few people you know the the, the young the young guys now that are really pay attention to the grape growing to the quality of the vineyard etc but but uh, 90, more than 90 percent of the grapes are produced by growers who are just looking for high volume because they get a very low grape price, like, mm -hmm. like below 30 cents per kilo. So they're not interested at all in producing uh, concentration or high quality fruit or whatever. They just look for the volume. Um, so no, this is not a wine grower's market. It's, a, it's a, still a wine seller's market. Mm -hmm. um, and, and don't forget that, you know, even super quality uh, producers like, let's say, Tradition or uh, El Maestro Sierra, who make beautiful beautiful traditional style sherries from Fino up to the oldest Amontillados and Olorosos. But when it comes to the base wine, all they do is buy very cheap Palomino base wine mm -hmm. from cooperatives usually. And uh, that's the starting point. They wouldn't even know where it comes from in many cases, where the fruit really, the juice really comes from. They'll buy a ready-made base wine they add the alcohol and then the whole the whole process oh, starts okay. with floor and aging and whatever. And that's in a way not how it should be, of course. Mm -hmm. I mean, even the biggest champagne producer will be perfectly able to tell you from which villages, from which vineyards the grapes are coming. Even if you talk huge volumes, if they want, they can tell you exactly. But in Jerez, I bet that most of the producers cannot really tell you from which vineyard, from which part of the area, the base wine is coming. They have no ID. They mm -hmm. don't care. It doesn't matter. And mm -hmm. that's very sad. Yeah. That's not maybe, how it should be. Maybe that's the influence of the, like, the, the big quantities and wine lakes. Yeah, yeah it's a relic the 70s, from the past. So, yeah. Exactly. It's a relic from the past. And, and you, you see, the, of course, you see exactly the same for Cava. You see the same in Rioja. Because even some of the, I mean, not the high quality Rioja producers, they know very well where the fruit is coming from. But, you know, I, I worked for, for very big producers like, like Bodegas y Vividas, uh, Campo Viejo and all that. Um, they, they basically, the winemakers have no ID mm -hmm. or a very general ID where the fruit comes from. Mm -hmm. And things are improving everywhere and also in Rioja, but, um, but it's, it's still quite a slow process. Okay. So you are yeah. optimistic about Jerez and then yes, things I are am. changing? Yes, I am. On the long run, I am. And on the long run, I am. But at the moment, it's still too early. Yeah. But it's coming now. It's coming. You can feel it in the air. If you mm -hmm. go to the area, you feel it in the air. And, and that the, the, the people I just talked about, the bodegas I just mentioned, they all know each other. They're good friends. They have the same ideas. And I'm sure they will attract new, fresh blood to the area. Other people who would like to take up the challenge, you know. And uh, it's, not, it's not, of course, that these very small people will change the area for good and for everybody. 
but they will add something to the area that makes the area more attractive to 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 the modern consumers mm -hmm. and that is i think very important yeah and yeah. change always happens with one person and then it gets True. influencing the rest so True. we'll see True. hopefully in Absolutely. a few years we will talk about more exciting things uh, from hedes yes for sure for sure for in sure. the meantime we have to go Ilem. you and yes yeah, we have we'll to go. go. We we'll have go. to go. We'll go. After post pandemic, yeah. we'll go. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Great. Thank you so much, Frank, for today's session. And thank Thanks you everybody. everyone for thank joining. Thank you, Ilan. Great. It was so nice we'll to see, see, you see you on Friday. On Friday about Chardonnay. Chardonnay, My yes. God, that's boring. It's the worst <laughs> grape ever. But we'll see. Okay. Let's do it. <laughs> Great. Okay. okay. Good. See Bye, you. everybody. Bye. 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 -bye.